The first speaker is Matt Pruitt. He's our president of Radical Exchange. I don't see you right now, but there you are. Okay. Uh, he's a former plaintiff's side antitrust and consumer litigator, a former law clerk at Federal Court for Southern New York, a programmer and writer in law, technology, and governance. Many of you might be familiar with his writing and the president of Radical Exchange. Please welcome Matt Pruitt, who will be speaking about data, law, and policy. Hello. Uh, so my name is Matt Pruitt. As Jen said, my background is as a, um, a litigator. And uh, one of the you know big projects that Radical Exchange is working on um, lately is this this problem of thinking about policy changes that can help uh, help us all get a grip on the problem of data. So I, I think that we all kind of agree uh, in a general sense that there's something uh, awry with the way that the value of data is is flowing through the economy. But um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of confusion and a lot of disagreement about the precise nature of the problem, and um, and about what to do about it. So, what one way of understanding what we are um, what we are up to is we're essentially, you know, taking a direct run at an extremely complex problem um, from a, sort of a policy point of view, and um, uh, we you know we we do think that in order to uh, we think that for various reasons, in order to, you know, it, to to fix the the problem at a fundamental level, we do think that some kind of change in legal and regulatory frameworks is is necessary, and we're trying to uh, envision what that might look like. So, okay, so one really fundamental aspect of a lot of our work at Radical Exchange is uh, has to do with the problem of value that comes from network effects. So. There's a there's a problem which is you know not exclusive to data but a, pro a problem that um, that is present in many many sectors of the economy where value creation processes depend on uh, intensely networked um, processes um, and and you know the in other words value is emerging from large networks of people and through network effects where uh, but property r rights are kind of are uh, are don't track those networks. You've got a mismatch between the sort of value creation process and the property right. Um, and what this does is it creates opportunities for uh, network rents. It creates opportunities for people, for you know, parties that are have certain advantageous positions within the system to extract value from uh, larger network value creation processes. Uh, so data is an example of this kind of process. It's created collaboratively. Uh, you know, we all are, we're all constantly through, you know, active and passive social activity, generating more information about one another and in this kind of interconnected way. Um, but the, uh, the ways that we sort of acquire, you know, rights over data don't always, uh, don't always track that. So uh, I just, I just want to sort of T taking a step back on this problem of network rents, um, I want to point out that this is not, it's not a new problem and it's not like some minor technical issue. Like if you look at the history of economics, many of the most sort of, you know, catastrophic um, uh, distortions of markets and inequalities and, and unjust situations can be understood as basically examples of uh, Property rights that uh, that are, you know are, are a mismatch for networked value creation processes and um, uh, network rents. So you can understand monopolies in this way. Like if you if if you are the owner of the you know only waterhole in the in the in the desert or something, right? Then you know the value of your of your franchise will increase through no you know not not as a result of you adding any value, but as a result of the other people in the system. Um, you know, creating value through um, economic activity and social activity and cultural activity. Um, uh, land can be understood in the same way. So this is this is a uh, a, a picture of a of a sign put up 100 years ago or so by a by a Georgist who uh, bought property in New York. I mean, and the the basic insight with land is just that 
you know, if you own if you own a piece of land in a in a dense developing city, then that that land increases in value as a result of the activity of people around the that land, who are you know, uh, engaging in business and you know creating culture and building you know deepening social ties and and those value creation processes are sort of decoupled from the land ownership. So. If you, you know, the people who, you know, if, if I bought some property in Berlin uh, 20 years ago, um, I, I could have just left it vacant and done nothing, uh, and I'd be doing great today. The reason I'd be doing great is that there's so many other people who are generating value, but the property right in land is allowing that value to be sort of e extracted in a way that's, you know, not fair and, uh, and also completely, completely inefficient. Uh, so data is not exactly like land, but it's important to, uh, to realize, uh, it's important to sort of see this, this connection and see that it is another case of a, of a mismatch between the sort of shape of property rights and the shape of value creation. So we can all see uh, that there are, um, that bad things result from concentrated control over data. Um, you know, it's, I don't need to sort of go, th go through the litany of horribles for the, the people in this room, I'm sure, but you can see that, that um, when certain, you know, when, when a handful of parties have the kind of a disproportionate uh, control over the data of millions of people, it enables them to have quite, uh, quite remarkable and quite uh, worrisome power over uh, all kinds of dimensions of, of people's lives. Um, and you know this is this is not again this is not like a small problem this is a, you know as as technology gets better and better and better more of our more of our lives more of our social activity more of our sort of the the, the product of our work and so on can be kind of uh, encoded as information and I if we lose control over that information uh, we you know there and just you know, we, we need to worry about kind of distortions of power and concentrations of power that could be, on, you know, really on a historic scale. You know, in the, in the same way that, 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 for example, control over land allowed a small number of people to ex exert really terrifying power in, you know, feudal societies. Uh, I mean, that's the sort of scale of the, of the worst case scenario that we should be worried about here. So one, one other kind of uh, table setting thing here is that um, I, I find that when I talk to people about this idea, about our ideas for changing you know, the way that data policy works, one of the most, one of the initial obstacles is getting past the idea that privacy is sufficient. So privacy is great. Um, I'm, I'm in favor of, of uh, privacy protection. I think it's, it's an essential component of of the interests that, that people have in data, but it doesn't exhaust the legitimate interests that we might, uh, that, we, that people have in data. So the, a, a basic way of framing that is I think there are two other buckets of interests, legitimate interests in our data or in our information that we need to consider, uh, which, I, which I'm calling financial interests and control interests. So the, the idea, the, the basic insight here is that it's possible to imagine uh, imagine being sort of cut out of the financial value of your data, even if your privacy isn't infringed. Similarly, it's possible to imagine being unable to control how your data is used, even even when your privacy isn't infringed. Um, and you know, this is this is a kind of just a small change in perspective, but it's really really important, and it uh, is the, it really kind of the 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 essence of why merely strengthening privacy protections isn't ever going to fully solve the, uh, the problem with, with you know, data value in the economy that we're all sort of intuiting. Uh, so we, uh, we sometimes use this metaphor of data as labor. Um, and this is just a metaphor. I think it's important not to push the metaphor too far, not to get too into the weeds with it, but it's also valuable to see why, why I kind of like this metaphor. What I like about it is that it, it, it captures the importance of these other kinds of categories of interest. So in other words, when you, um, when you supply your labor, uh, you, uh, you, have these, you, you have sort of financial interests and, and control interests. And the way to think about that is that you know, first, you, you have the ability to 
uh, negotiate for like a fair deal in exchange for your labor. And second, you have the ability to withhold your labor uh, from, let's say, employers who you don't want to work for. So, um, uh, you know, and this is, this is, this is, you know, a, these, these categories of interests in our labor are really important. And uh, as data increasingly becomes kind of the output of the work that we do in our lives, we need to consider ways of um, uh, uh, strengthening our hand to protect these kinds of interests in our data. Um, and I, I should also say that, you know, um, to spoil the surprise a little bit, I mean, the way that the, the basic framework that we have in mind for, um, for data, uh, you know, data policy is a collective bargaining framework. So what, what we're thinking about is ways of, um, uh, w ways of enabling people to group their interests and collectively bargain for all these different kinds of interests in data, privacy interests, but also financial interests and control interests. And it's another you know, reason why the labor metaphor is somewhat attractive because you have this history of labor unions you know, whereby people are negotiating for um, all, you know, all these different kinds of interests. So um, in, order to, in order to understand um, uh, the framework that, we are, that we're sketching here, uh, it's important to take a step back and think about the nature of the asset in question. So the way that we normally think about data is, um, you know, we think about a, a set of separate individuals, each of whom have kind of separate data sets which are, which are attached to them, right? And, and then the, the, the way that that works is, you know, if we all have separate sets of data, then, you know, we all have kind of individual uh, bargaining positions, you know, with, and we take our individual rights over our data and we go to counterparties like, let's say, Google or, or Facebook or whatever uh, platform or, or third party that, um, that um, you know, can, can monetize your data. We trade our data in exchange for free services or, or low cost services or whatever, and, um, and, and that's that. The problem is that this is really based on just a, a fundamentally wrong conception of what data is and uh, how our interests in it overlap. So the individual data sets are always comprised of information about other people, information other people have helped to co-produce and information that affects other people's interests. So, um, you know, some quick examples of, of, of this are just, you know, if I've got, if, if you and I have engaged in a, uh, you know, uh, text conversation, then there's, a, you know, there's a thread of, of, of text between us uh, representing our conversation, which is part of my data set, but it's also part of your data set. Similarly, if I, um, if there's like a, like a, a group picture, a picture of, of you and, and three other people, that's in your data set, but it's also in those other three people's data sets. And it, um, you know, it, it is the same information. So you can, you can almost think of data as sort of like a snapshot of some underlying thing, which is information. And the, if, if we think of, uh, you know, if we think of data as individual, strictly individual assets, we miss the fact that um, when we are negotiating for our data, we're actually negotiating for something of value which was created in this shared way. So, uh, you know, how can we start to move towards a model that, um, that allows us to negotiate um, uh, on, on kind of a grouped basis with, with third parties? That's what we are trying to figure out. And an important, uh, you know, an important next step here, an important, you know, additional insight to realize is that the, the closer people are to one another, for example, in a social network, the more their data overlaps. So, uh, you know, if, if, if when you consider yourself vis-a-vis -vis people you barely know or people who are on the other side of the world, you may have very little overlapping information, but vis-a-vis -vis your family, you have an immense uh, amounts of, inf of informational overlap in your data sets. This is not just like your, uh, not just your sort of personal information, not just your text messages, but also your, your DNA, uh, your health information. All kinds of, of information um, overlaps in this way. And um, the closer people are to one another, the more they have in common, 
the more, uh, the more overlap you have. Um, now, um, given that data overlaps in this way, um, th there's a problem. Because when we go to third parties and try to negotiate for, uh, for our interests, viewed a certain way, we're only negotiating for that kind of, that kind of margin, which could be a quite narrow sliver of our data set, which is unique. So, you know, if I've, if I, if you and I have had a text conversation, um, you know, that might, that's going to be in, in, in my data set. But if I go to, uh, you know, Facebook and effectively try to bargain for the value of that text conversation with Facebook, I may not be able to get anything in return because they may have it from, from you. They may, ha may have it from some other source. So, and, and you can imagine that, you know, as, as the network grows, as you get more circles layered onto this picture, that sort of margin of unique information gets narrower and narrower and narrower. So if you viewed in this way, you can think of data, you know, it kind of makes sense to think of, of data as potentially being um, something whose value decreases with scale, or, or decreases, you know, the, the marginal value of which decreases with scale. So that as we, you know, are, are in larger and larger groups, each of us as individuals has less and less bargaining power. But of course, that's not really the whole story because the in our, our data sets also ha contain information about one another that isn't in the other people's data sets. So for example, if I have, I may have, um, an, an example of this would be, uh, let's say there's nothing in my Netflix watching history that suggests that I might like Stanley Kubrick films. But if you look at my friends watching histories, uh, it's full of Kubrick, right? So there's nothing in my data set that suggests I might like Kubrick. But if you have my friends' data sets, you actually have valuable information about me, which you've gotten through them. And so that, that kind of information, that sort of complementary information that we each sort of carry about one another you know, creates that kind of additive area in the middle where, you know, where our, our data sets are overlapping and providing richer and richer insights about one another. Um, and that, that's the most valuable data. That's the data that is most useful for making predictions about people's behavior, for, um, you know, providing higher value services to people and uh, any number of other things. Uh, but we, but because we sort of bargain from this perspective, uh, and because it's hard to identify, you know, what, you know, in what exact situations this kind of complementary additive thing is happening, essentially that, that, you know, that complementary data in the middle, the value of it uh, ends up being completely captured by, by platforms. Uh, we have a lot of trouble um, bargaining for it from an individual uh, uh, position. So what what we uh, what we envision, uh, long story short, is uh, uh, a network of sort of data cooperatives, which would be essentially like a new a new class of legal entity, towards uh, to which groups of people could assign different kind of overlapping categories of rights to their data. Um, Data cooperatives could represent different sorts of, of interests in different ways. So in other words, they might, they might represent people who have kind of uh, similar kinds of data. They might also represent people who have similar sort of priorities or similar sort of interests in how their data is used. And you know, an Im important thing to realize is that, is that you know, figuring out the sort of proper uh, grouped configurations from which people should be, you know, could be bargaining for the value of their data is an extremely complex question, and it would be helpful to have some kind of uh, market process through which everyone could, um, you know, exercise their own intelligence and their own judgment and uh, and uh, advocate for their own priorities in terms of figuring out how these um, these uh, uh, grouped bargaining entities should be composed. Um, the, the idea is that data cooperatives would sort of step into the shoes of individuals as the counterparty with which uh, platforms and other third parties are negotiating. So a, da a data cooperative would be the entity that negotiates your privacy policy, your terms of use, your ability, you know, your, your 
uh, the terms on which you're, you're compensated for the value of data, the, and, 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 and so on. Um, and so for, for, for a variety of reasons, some of which I've touched on and some of which I'll elaborate on a little bit more, uh, we think that in order for this kind of architecture to emerge, uh, legislative change w is, is either, uh, either necessary or would be extremely helpful. Um, so here's, here are the sort of features of the, of the uh, legal and regulatory scheme that we have envisioned um, to put into place this kind of, this kind of system. So first, we, we, we think that there, there needs to be some sort of, I mean, now, uh, to be clear, we're, we're operating, I mean, some of the work that we've done is a little bit, um, a little bit oriented towards the United States uh, context, so some of this might, might be like, you know, five degrees off in translation, but the, the general principles are the same. That we, th we, we envision some kind of a, something called a data relations board, which would be sort of an adjudicative or rulemaking body modeled on labor relations boards, which, you know, have, have governed the relationships between unions in the past, labor unions, uh, which would um, uh, do a range of things from sort of clarifying technical situations uh, in the, you know, in a piece of putative legislation, and also resolving different kinds of, of conflicts between, um, between um, data cooperatives, which I'll, I'll, I'll get to in just a second. So, um, you know, the, the other sort of module of this is that, the, is that, you know, data cooperatives, in order to ensure that they don't themselves become sort of exploitative entities, they would be governed by a really strict set of uh, fiduciary style duties that they would owe to, to their members. Uh, second, they would be, you know, for various kinds of important decisions that data cooperatives might take that could impact the interests of their members, they would be subject to, uh, you, you know, these decisions should be taken democratically. Uh, additionally, the, you know, some, for the same kinds of reasons that I was uh, alluding to before, that, you know, indiv individuals' data overlaps, similarly, the data, the large data sets that are assigned to data cooperatives would overlap, which, create, which would create situations of conflict between the data cooperatives. Um, these, these conflicts would need, to be, um, would need to be managed through kind of uh, democratic processes that involve multiple data cooperatives, as well as kind of a system of lateral claims that data cooperatives could make against one another. So that, for example, you know, if one data cooperative was essentially um, uh, um, uh, selling data in a way that is undermining another data cooperative and sort of cutting the members of that other data cooperative out of the deal, um, that, you know, that second data cooperative should have some sort of claim on the first. And uh, finally, uh, there need to be new rules um, about uh, permanently alienating data. So in other words, if, as long as it's possible for data cooperatives to sort of permanently sell absolute rights to use data, this kind of collective bargaining system uh, is going to be undermined because, um, because a secondary market will, will emerge that will, you know, um, uh, undermine the ability of data cooperatives to uh, continue to, to um, you know, bargain for the interests of, of their members. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm, running, I'm running short on time. Uh, so, I mean, you know, the basic idea of the data relations board is that, you know, because data, th this is such a rapidly evolving space, these, you know, these regulations would need to evolve and you know, there would need to be some kind of arbitrator to referee the disputes that would arise between different data cooperatives. Um, uh, some of the sort of highlights of the set of fiduciary duties that um, we imagine d data cooperatives um, owing to their members are, you know, some, some highlights here are, for example, limited term contracts with, with members. So for example, um, uh, if data cooperatives are able to lock up their members for a very long period of time, then you kind of lose the ability of, of, um, uh, of exit, you know, as opposed to voice to be a, a mechanism through which members are, um, are, 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 are exerting control over the data cooperatives that are supposed to be representing their interests. Um, 
and uh, you know, so a couple other things are you know, the idea um, the idea that data cooperatives shouldn't be shouldn't be owned or controlled by uh, by non data cooperatives. So we think there's kind of an irresolvable conflict of interest that could emerge if you know, like let's say Google established its own data cooperatives. They should be separate you know a separate class of of bargaining entity. Um, uh, um, as I was suggesting, the the idea that data cooperatives should be democratically controlled is is um, really important. So, um, one of the most important uh, actions that data cooperatives might take in order to uh, negotiate for the interests of members would be, for example, to um, to withhold data from some third party service. Um, uh, you know, in, in the something akin to like a, like a data strike or a boycott. Um, in order for that kind of thing to be possible, data cooperatives would need to have uh, power over their members' uh, interests, right? They'd need to be able to take actions that could, um, that could um, impact members' lives. Um, and uh, for that reason, uh, we think that uh, a, a kind of well-designed, rich system of of democratic communication between members and, and data cooperatives is, um, is essential. Um, and uh, in, in the interest of time, I won't, I won't go into uh, too much more about these sort of lateral claims between cooperatives, but you can see that if, if, if data cooperatives don't have the ability to sort of communicate laterally be between one another through democratic mechanisms or through sort of um, injunctive style claims against one another, you will have this sort of race to the bottom such that they will not be effectively advocating for, for their members' interests. Um, and uh, yeah, why don't I, uh, I'm, I'll, leave it, I'll leave it there and maybe have time for a few questions. Or like one question, okay, thanks. Thank you, Matt.